tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 5 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Hey, Heartlanders, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to join the club. You'll get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support, and you get a whole lot for it. Well, Heartlanders, quick sidebar. We here at the Fear from the Heartland show and the entire Chilling Tales for Dark Nights team are excited for the changes that 2023 will bring. We'd like to present one of those changes to you tonight. It's a brand new year, and we have brand new merchandise for everyone. My beautiful wife, Nikki, overhauled our selection of Fear from the Heartland goodies that you can take with you anywhere. Shop and explore from over 70 products, all featuring the brand new Fear from the Heartland logo design, including stickers, pins, mugs, clothing, and so much more. To check it out, just click the New Year New Merch link in the description. Ah, Heartlanders. I've been fortunate enough to make friends with many of you over the past couple of years, and for that, I'm extremely grateful. The way I see it, we'll be friends till we're old and senile. Then we'll be new friends. Speaking of friends, I have to take a moment and give a much needed shout out to Melissa Medina, who has a guest spot tonight on the first story by newcomer to Fear from the Heartland, Paris Clark. I hearken back to October 2021, Fear from the Heartland isn't even three months old and we had a special Halloween podcast in the works. We were in need of a female voice actor and our friend, N.M. Brown, COO of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, suggested Melissa Medina. I am so glad for that suggestion, as she has been a guest on Fear from the Heartland a number of times. Melissa is a pure professional, is great to work with, and I'm proud to call her a Heartlander. Thank you ever so much, Melissa. Tonight's second tale comes from another Fear from the Heartland friend, Xavier Poe Kane. Let's get after it. Patrick Fitz, who becomes an alcoholic after a traffic accident takes the lives of his wife and son, is given a chance to rewrite the past and save his family. Failing each time to save them, he begins to realize he was the one who caused the accident in the first place. And now, dear listener, for your indulgence, Hinges by Paris Clark. The sun makes an unwelcoming appearance as Patrick Fitz wakes to a frozen morning. His head throbs as the first rays of sunlight slice through the parted curtains and reach his retinas, which cause him to growl and turn away. His newly found drinking habit is taking a toll on him, but he doesn't care. He welcomes every headache, every bout of compulsive vomiting, 
and all the random cuts and bruises that he acquires during his blackouts. He forces himself off the hotel bed and sways as the blood rushes from his head. The feeling has gone almost as fast as it came. He begins looking around the disheveled room for the bottle he had last night, hoping he hasn't finished it. The one liter bottle of Royal Club whiskey lays in the bed next to where he had been sleeping. The top is off, resulting in the darkening of the beige bed sheets. He frowns, picks it up, and sees it contains roughly four mouthfuls. Gotta catch the hair of that dog. He takes a drink. It tastes stale. His short, oily brown hair stands matted and alert in all directions. He still wears the button-up red plaid shirt he had dug out of the dirty clothes trash bag yesterday. It had been, and still is, covered in wrinkles. Luckily, his coat and a few squirts of Axe body spray will mask the musty smell radiating off him. His jeans are dusty, but clean enough for him to wear for a few more days unless he falls in a mud puddle. He remembers Janice Storm, the sexy blonde weather lady who he thinks made up her last name to fit her occupation, saying it wasn't supposed to rain or snow for a few more days. Luck is in his favor for once. He finds the top to the bottle, twists it on, and goes about his morning duties. Shit, no shower, no shave. Though he is looking a bit rugged, no dental cleansing, and speedy quickly with himself involving the shower he has turned on to wash away his never future children. He cleans off his hands in manhood with a damp rag and then finishes up with a few squirts of body spray to his armpits and the front of his shirt. He leaves the cramped bathroom, snatches his brown Carhartt coat off the single chair next to the window, tugs it on, then slips into his Wolverine steel-toed work boots and takes one more drink from the bottle before hiding it under his coat as he departs. He stands in an aisle at his local hardware store looking at fumigation chemicals, insecticides, and rodent poisons. One would do the trick, he thinks, as he picks up a yellow box of rat poison pellets. The front shows a picture of a dead rat laying on its back, along with a red toxic warning label. The back gives safety directions for someone who has ingested it, along with the number for the Center for Disease Control. It also claims that in California, it had been proven to cause cancer. According to California, everything causes fucking cancer. I wish that was the only thing I had to think about. So how should I do this? Crush them up, mix them in with some food? That's what they do on TV, and it always seems to do the trick. He sighs and places the box back on the shelf. Sleeping pills. Sleeping pills are the best way to go. Take a full bottle, lights up for eternity. Painkillers? CO poisoning? A hose from the tailpipe through the window into the cab. Hear that's like falling asleep. He wipes a tear racing down his right cheek, then looks around to see no one. He pulls the bottle of whiskey from his coat and takes a mouthful. He wipes away another tear as he returns the bottle and heads to the exit. God, why did you do this to me? The cashier, a blonde teen, looks to be just a year or two older than his son, glares at him as he shoves out the front door. He isn't sure if the stare was derived from sympathy or disgust, but does it really matter? Go ahead and stare. Take a good look at what a man wishing to die but is too cowardly to try looks like. Take it in, boy, study it, hate it, and hope and pray it never finds you. The whole town knows of his pain. How could they not? Crest Hill has a population of 1,768, and when something bad or distasteful happens, the people dive headfirst into the gossip orgy. The same day of a person's misfortune, the town knows all the secrets, storylines, and details some of which are new news to the very person they are orgasming over. He sways down the sidewalk of Main Street, the only commercial street in town where his hotel room and the liquor store are just a short distance away from one another. Dollar General is the only corporate store in town, all the others are family owned. The only mechanic shop slash gas station slash fast food place is the Conoco, a mile outside city limits on Highway 1. That strip of asphalt lets travelers bypass this rinky-dink town without ever knowing of its existence, and most do. He passes by a few other stores, Flea Market, 
barber shop and laundromat. I need to go there this afternoon, he says to himself, his breath visible in the frigid morning air. Frost is still visible on the light poles where the sun's radiation has yet to touch. The liquor that's still in his blood from last night coupled with the fresh dose in his stomach keeps him warm, keeps him from sinking to his knees to confront reality. It numbs him, lets his mind wander, and at times, go blank. When he passes out for hours on end or is regurgitating it back out, his thoughts are empty and that's the way he wants them. If he can stay empty and numb, there will be no more pain, no more sadness, no more regret or self-hatred. He stops and looks through the plate glass windows that make the front wall of Jimmy's pharmaceuticals. Where do you keep your sleeping pills? The morbidly obese brunette pharmacist, Susan Jenkins, sits behind the counter reading a romance novel. She had gotten knocked up by their fellow classmate, Thomas Matthews, during their senior year of high school, when she was 200 pounds lighter. They got married a week after graduation and had three more wonderful children over the past 15 years. She goes to take a sip of her coffee on the counter beside her when she notices him staring. She gives him a faint smile, then takes a sip of her coffee, sits it back down, and gives him a slight wave. He can see it in her eyes. You think you understand the pain, the sorrow, the guilt? I should have gone with her. I should be with them now dead. She swerved too hard. I would have done differently. I would have kept control of the car. Maybe they wouldn't be gone if I would have gone. Maybe we would have left at a different time. Maybe we would have left earlier. Maybe later. I should have been more authoritative. I told Becky I wanted the night to ourselves. We wanted another child. We... He sees her eyes turn brow pinch and face turned to sadness before he realizes tears are cascading down his face. He turns, wipes them away, and hurries down the sidewalk a few more paces before cutting across the empty street. Walking up the concrete steps of the liquor store, he guzzles the last two mouthfuls of whiskey and then tosses the glass bottle into the trash bin next to the entrance door. The built-in sand trap atop is filled with cigarette butts. He pushes the glass door open. A bell chimes, alerting the inhabitants of his entering. We're not open for another ten minutes, Travis, the burly gray-haired man, tells him, not bothering to turn around to formally address him. He is arranging the bottles that line the shelf behind the counter. The orange vest and camouflage jacket he wears tells Patrick he was supposed to be hunting right now and not taking the shift of an employee who has apparently called in. Can you make an exception, please? Travis turns, his face slowly turning into a frown. What do you want? A bottle of the strongest sleeping pills you got. A pint of Royal Club. You sure you don't want a fifth? He questions as he turns and plucks a plastic bottle from the bottom shelf. You know you will just be back for more and end up getting picked up by the police again. He scans its barcode before placing it on the counter. If you stay this course... They're going to end up keeping you in there and force you into a treatment program. Patrick wipes his cheeks, making sure his eyes aren't still leaking. It is what it is, he replies as he places a crinkled $10 bill on the counter. The old man takes the crunched up bill. He taps a few keys on the register, releasing the cash drawer. He retrieves his change and hands it to him. Get out of here, he tells him before he begins straightening the bottles again. He leaves and retraces his steps as he heads to the clearly visible bright yellow Dollar General logo at the opposite end of the street. He has to restock his non-perishable microwavable food items. He twists the top off the bottle. The crunch of the seal breaking gives him a shiver of excitement. He coughs as the liquor reaches his chest but rejoices when its warmth finds his stomach. This is much better than the stale stuff left over from last night. Slowing his walk, he takes a deep breath, letting the cold air ease the burning of his throat. Letting the air out, he raises the bottle back to his lips. Euphoria. The sound of a vehicle creeping up behind him makes him take the bottle prematurely from his mouth. He checks over his shoulder and sure enough, it's a patrol car. He swiftly spins the top on and tucks it into the inside pocket of his coat. Over the past few weeks, he has been taken to the station and put in the drunk tank three times. 
They never bother citing him for public intoxication. They all pity him. He knows he will be picked up again if they get their hands on him, so he opens the next door he comes to and slips inside. The hinges of the dark old oak door creak as he enters. From its small circular window, he watches the patrol car slowly creep closer. The patrol car comes to a stop in front of him. The driver's window rolls down. Patrick's breath is fogging the glass as he looks into the eyes of a stranger. He knows all four of the cops in town, and this man is not one of them. He is ghostly pale, has bright green eyes, bleach blonde hair, and is smiling ear to ear. He sticks half of his body out the window and gives Patrick an overzealous wave. He wears a green suit with orange pinstripes, an orange dress shirt underneath, and a green bow tie around his neck. I hope you have a fine and dandy time, the stranger gleefully yells at him. You probably won't, but that's just life, ain't it? All shits and giggles without any of the giggles, eh? Whoop, I better be on my way. And remember, make good life choices and always choose your words wisely. Dooly do. He gives another enthusiastic wave before slipping back into the car. The lights begin to flash as the siren begins to blare. The tires spin and squall as he speeds off. Welcome. An old cranky woman's voice greets him from behind. He sighs and tries to open the door to leave, but the knob won't turn. He tries again with both hands, but it doesn't budge. Sorry, sugar, but that handle only works when it wants to. Ever thought about changing the damn thing? He replies as he strains to turn the knob. It ain't going to work, the old woman tells him. Then how do I get out? He asks as he turns to face the voice behind him. The room is dim. A single light bulb hangs over a heavy mahogany door that stands in the middle of the floor. In the far corner, a dark-skinned elderly woman sits rocking back and forth in a wooden chair. A black and red checkered quilt lies over her legs. The black pipe she is puffing on creates a gray cloud that obscures her face, leaving only her straight white hair visible. A cast iron wood burning stove stands a few feet from her. You're fine in here, she says. I tend to have a couple of drinks myself when I feel the need to, so by all means. He pulls the bottle from his coat and takes in his elixir. So, how do I get out of here? She points toward the door in the middle of the room. Through there. You're going senile. The woman shakes her head. No, no, I don't think so. At least not yet. He walks to the door, turns the bronze knob and pulls it open, revealing the opposite wall that is made of the same old oak as the other three walls and the doors. Lady, I'm not in the mood for jokes. And I am not a jester. She replies. Your only chance of escape is through that door. He points at the door knife-handedly and with an aggravated voice states, There is nothing through that fucking door. How do you know? You haven't tried it. She tells him. He rolls his eyes before taking a mouthful from his bottle and then returns it to his coat. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll play your stupid game. He swiftly swings the door open and steps forward. His boots crunch on gravel. Ahead is a moonlit highway and beyond it a forest. He looks back to see a forest has taken the place of the room he has left. A brisk fog comes from his mouth as he curses. What the fuck is this shit? Headlights appear on the highway to the right of him. They are too far away for him to hear the vehicle. Off in the distance to his left, but close enough to discern the difference between firecrackers and gunshots, somebody is letting out a rapid burst of lead. A single headlight rounds the curve, speeding away from that direction. It is swaying back and forth on the highway. The vehicle to the right is getting closer. He has to try and stop one of them before the worst happens. Stepping onto the edge of the asphalt just before the white line, he begins waving his arms to get the attention of the vehicle with the two headlights. He's confident the driver will see him. The full moon is bright. He can hear the vehicle now, but it shows no signs of slowing. The headlights are actually getting closer to his side of the road. 
He begins yelling at them to stop moments before he has to dive away onto the gravel shoulder. The driver of the dark SUV slightly weaves, but overcorrects too hard, sending it swerving uncontrollably. Moments later, the one headlight crashes into the side of the SUV near its rear tires, sending the vehicle tumbling. A body is flung high into the air before the vehicle crashes into the trees. The descending body splashes onto the asphalt. The sudden calamity deafens all his senses. He has only felt this way once before, and that had been the worst day of his life. His hands are shaking as he reaches for his bottle. The large mouthful makes him cough. The scene, lit by the full moon, seems all too familiar to him. This isn't possible. He runs to the wreckage. He slows at the first vehicle to see the one headlight that once guided it is now just another piece of the crushed carnage that's the front of the silver Chevrolet S10 truck. The front is hissing and steaming as the busted radiator pours out its contents. The driver's side window is shattered. Mark's lifeless head is leaning slightly out of the window, his dead eyes looking up to the full moon. His nose is gone. In its place is a fleshy void where chips of bone and flesh cling to what skin is left. Blood coats the bottom of his face. Patrick can't comprehend how someone with this type of injury could survive long enough to drive anywhere. A slight moan from the body on the asphalt regains his full attention. He sprints to the woman's side and is horrified by what he sees. Her body is twisted like a pretzel. Her jeans have been pulled from her. Her right leg is covered in deep bleeding gashes. Her left is dislocated at the hip, causing her foot to be laying next to head. He can barely make out his wife's face. Most of the flesh has been ripped away, along with part of her scalp. The rest is somewhere among the wreckage. The only obvious detail telling him that it is his wife is the sweater she is wearing, though now it's nothing more than a tether of white cotton. It barely covers her breast. It is her favorite one and was the one she was wearing the night she left. Her one eye that has not been torn away opens and looks up at him and whispers, Patrick. He kneels beside her, taking her bloodied hand. Tears are cascading down his face. I'm here, baby. Don't try to talk. You're going to be okay. Help is on its way. Bobby, she whispers. He's okay. He lies. He knows his son died from a broken neck during the crash. She gives a slight smile as she takes her last breath. Headlights appear from the direction his wife had come. That would be Crystal. A dark oak door with a bronze handle appears behind him. It opens, letting out a shadowy human-like creature that swiftly wraps its arms around him and pulls him through the door before he can let out a scream. It slams shut and disappears. The door before the old woman opens. Patrick comes tumbling back through the darkness beyond the door, thudding his back against the wall six feet away from her. What the fuck was that? He yells as he hurries up off the floor. He wipes his face to remove the tears before reaching for his bottle. The woman is still clouded in a haze of smoke. It was your way of escape. Escape my ass? I just watched my wife and son die. He takes a drink. Isn't that why you're in this room? Isn't that why you took the drink? Isn't that why you're trapped? Not only here, but in your own mind. She removes the pipe from her mouth and taps it on the arm of the chair, causing a fine dust of ash to fall to the floor. I'm giving you the chance to change the worst day of your life, so you can escape this hell. You have five chances left. So choose what you intend to do wisely. She reaches back under the quilt, retrieves a lighter, and lights up before returning it back to its hiding spot. So you're telling me I have to relive that night five more times? He grumbles. Yes. She replies as she gives her pipe a puff. Her face is once again hidden. Or you can sit here, drink your bottle, and die of malnourishment. It's up to you. To me, it makes no difference. So how exactly does this work? He asks as he takes a step towards the door. Just think of what you need to do, and the door will guide the way. But know this. 
you cannot appear in the same place or time twice, or too far from the actions that brought you here. I have to stop that truck, he says as he opens the door and walks back through. Once again, his boots crunch on gravel, but this time he stands under a streetlight. A half mile to his right, a gas station is lit up like a beacon for weary travelers. Its red and white Conoco sign stands glowing high above the highway. To his left, he can see two headlights speeding towards him. The vehicle flashes under a streetlight revealing the silver Chevrolet truck. He steps out onto the highway to stop him, but the truck never slows or veers. He tries to move but isn't quick enough and the truck's passenger side slams into him, sending him spinning and slamming onto the gravel shoulder. He screams in agony. He looks down at his legs to see his jeans begin to darken with blood and the tip of a bone sticking through his jeans on his right leg. He averts his eyes from them to see the truck pull into the gas station as the door appears in front of him and opens. The dark shadowy creature quickly snags a hold of one of his broken legs and yanks him through the door. He rolls back into the room. The door slams shut behind him. He expects to be in agony but is relieved to find his legs are in full working order. He stands, takes a quick step, reaches for the doorknob, but then halts. He pulls his bottle and takes a drink as he begins to think of his next move. He tries to remember every detail of the newspaper article he read two months ago. The truck stopped at the gas station like last time. I heard the shots. Mark robbed the place and got a little more than he bargained for. So what the fuck should I do? try to stop Mark from robbing the place or try and stop the clerk from shooting him. If I stop Mark, then I will save the clerk's life and my family's. He turns the knob and walks through the door. He steps for the third time onto gravel, but this time it's the parking lot beside the gas station. Usually there would be a couple of 18-wheelers staying the night out here, but not tonight. He watches Mark get out of his truck wearing a black hoodie, what looks like a black beanie, and a pair of black gloves. He walks to the front of his truck to inspect the damage he had just taken. Patrick hears Mark curse when he sees his busted grill and headlight. Patrick makes it to the lights illuminating the fuel pumps just as Mark is pulling the black ski mask that Patrick thought was a beanie over his face. Hey man, you don't want to do that, Patrick says as he walks up to him with his hands raised to show that he is no threat to him. Mark pulls a silver revolver from his hoodie pocket and points it at his chest. Go fuck yourself, he tells him and fires a round into his chest. Patrick collapses onto the concrete. Suddenly, it's hard for him to breathe. He watches Mark go into the store as he gasps for air. The door appears in front of him. The creature leans out from the darkness beyond its threshold, grabs his arm, and quickly pulls him in. He slides across the floor as the door slams behind him. He gasps for air. Three down, three to go, the woman says as she rocks back and forth, the chair squeaking. He lies still for a few minutes, taking deep breaths. He's pissed off. First he hits me with his truck, and now he shoots me in the chest. He snaps. He rises and walks through the door, only to still be in the room. The woman softly laughs and reminds him, not at the same place or the same time. He slams the door, takes another drink from his bottle. He has a good buzz. He thinks for a brief moment before opening it again. This time he steps onto the linoleum floor of the gas station. He's at the back wall in front of the coolers that refrigerate the drinks. In front and one aisle over from him, Mark is at the register making his demands. Patrick quickly walks up the aisle towards him. Hurry the fuck up, Mark shouts as the middle-aged Hispanic man shoves what he has into a large round plastic jar on the counter. Patrick rounds the end of the aisle and steps on the strips of plastic-wrapped beef jerky that were once in the jar that's now being filled with what change the clerk has. A few coins drop to the counter, dinging as they bounce from it onto the floor. Go fuck yourself, he mocks as he punches Mark in the side of the face. The gun goes off. Mark and the clerk fall. Patrick goes to kick him, but Mark quickly raises the gun and sends a round through his neck and out the back of his skull. Darkness. He's lying face up on the floor next to the old woman when he wakes. He lays there, realizing that his anger is not going to help his situation. 
it's best to stay still until he can calm down and start thinking straight again. He pulls out his bottle, which is half full, and takes a sip. He would stop drinking, but knows that will give him a headache and cause his hunger to grow more than it already is. It's best to stay at the level he is now. No more, no less. He lays back, going over his next plan of attack. Not at the same place and not at the same time. What other options do I have? If I appear at the pumps as he comes out, he'll just shoot me again. I gotta be across the highway. I have to stop the clerk. There's no other option now. He makes that shot before he dies. Mark didn't realize he wasn't dead before he ditched the gun. The police found it across the highway from the station. If I can get that gun, then I can kill the clerk before he kills Mark. Then Mark can swerve out of the way. She might still crash into the woods, but it might give them a chance to live. I have to kill the clerk. He takes 20 minutes to regain his composure and rises focused. He looks at the door with determination and then walks through. His boots crunch on leaves as he steps to the edge of the tree line opposite the station. He's expecting to see Mark speeding away and the clerk standing in the doorway emptying the 17-round magazine of his Glock 45. Instead, he sees Mark run out of the gas station carrying the jar full of money. He makes it to his truck and throws a revolver over the roof. It skids across the highway and rolls onto the graveled shoulder. Patrick takes a few steps forward and picks up the gun. It's heavy in his hand. He hasn't shot a pistol since he was a teenager. Mark slams his truck door closed and cranks the engine. Patrick instinctively ducks as a shot rings out. The silver S10 juts forward. Another shot rings out, hitting the side of the truck. He has a clear sight of the clerk who is slumped in the doorway. The front of his light yellow polo shirt is covered in blood. Another shot rings out but misses entirely. Patrick grips the pistol tightly with both hands, raises, and fires. He misses. Another shot rings out. Then another. The clerk's bullet hits the tailgate. Patrick fires again, shattering the glass window next to the clerk. He can tell he doesn't know where the gunshots are coming from because he's still shooting at Mark. Another shot rings out from the clerk's pistol. The passenger side mirror explodes. This time he cocks the hammer back himself and concentrates. Another shot. Another. Another. They all miss. He fires again. The clerk drops to his knees. Mark is just about to round the corner when the clerk releases another shot. The back windshield of the S-10 shatters a moment before it disappears around the corner. Behind him, the door appears again and he is yanked through. The revolver drops to the ground as it reaches the darkness at the door's threshold. A few moments later, a boom erupts as the vehicles crash into each other. The door opens. Patrick is shoved out of the darkness and into the room. The door slams shut behind him. His chin is nestled to his chest. He feels beaten. Sugar, don't feel so down, the woman tells him. You still have another chance to make things right. No, I don't, he replies as he pulls the bottle from his coat and sits down against the wall facing the door. He slowly twists the bottle off and throws it at the door. He watches it bounce off and land in front of him. It spins before it topples to a stop. He takes in a mouthful and then begins sobbing. He sits, drinks, and cries until the bottle is empty. Then he just cries. Ten minutes later, the cadence of his crying is broken. You still have one more chance left, sugar. The woman assures him as she empties her pipe and goes through her routine of loading it and firing it back up. He's rightfully drunk now. What should I do? At what time? Have I not been there? He stands and walks through the door. Nothing happens. He walks through again. Nothing happens. Again. Again. What the fuck do I do? He screams as he continues to pace back and forth through the door. What do I do? 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 It's all up to you, sugar. Only you know the worst day of your life. That is the worst day of my life, and I fucking caused it all. It adds up. Everything that happened was because of me. Because I'm a drunk. Because I came into this fucking building. Because I walked through that fucking door. The door slams shut behind him. 
He stops, wipes the tears from his face, turns, opens it. I wish I never walked through this door, he whispers, then disappears through it. The bright light causes him to squint as his boots step onto the front porch of his country house. As his eyes adjust, he sees his wife's pristine raven black 92 Ford Bronco next to his dusty red 86 Dodge Ram. Beyond them and across the highway stands the remains of tan corn stalks that had been cut a few weeks prior. He realizes he's sober and that he's home. He had left this place the day after the deaths of his wife and son. He couldn't stay here. Too many good memories and thoughts of what could have been just made him more depressed and suicidal than he already was. The smell of his wife's Kelvin Klein perfume makes his knees weak. A hand grabs his ass as lips press against his cheek. She trots past him and down the steps gracefully in her white cotton sweater. Her straight brown hair floats in the wind behind her. We will probably be back around 11 tonight, so don't wait up. Unless you want to try for another one. She winks and blows him a kiss before she opens the door of the Bronco. Wait, I'm going with you, he blurts out, almost screaming the words. She smiles. That's fine, but you better hurry and get changed. And call the mill and tell them you won't be coming in tonight. Right, he says, and then aggressively tells her, I'm driving. She mouths a silent, okay reply and waves her hands, gesturing to him to go get ready. Hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, Hinges, by Paris Clark. Paris Clark is an author from a small town in Arkansas. His love for stories and all things fascinatingly weird and disturbing has inspired him to create universes where his characters can come to life. Having no literary degree, his vivid imagination and the compulsion to rid his thoughts of his ideas has enabled him to create stories we all can enjoy. Paris is currently pursuing a degree in computer science. While not focusing on school work or writing, he enjoys fishing, gardening, reading, and video games. An old trapper in the wilds of Montana makes his way to St. Louis, leaving his trade behind. The reason for the abandonment of his work is tied to a tall tale. After a reporter hears his story, he is convinced the old trapper is telling the truth. After the reporter leaves, he tells the rest of the story to a gambler. Much to the gambler's chagrin, he too believes the story, and most likely isn't sure he wanted to hear it. And now for your indulgence, Kadat's Pass by Xavier Pocaine. Everett House Hotel, St. Louis, Missouri, 17 October, 1865. Part One, The Reporter. Any interesting characters come in lately, Scott? Matthew Bartle, reporter for the Missouri Democrat, asked the hotel's barkeep as he took a sip of the whiskey he just ordered from an old friend. Well, there's this trapper that just got in took a Missouri River steamer all the way from Montana. He tells a truly strange tale, Scott said as he finished polishing one glass and picked up another. He's upstairs with a... The sound of footfalls on a staircase drew the barkeep's attention away from the glass in hand. You're in luck. Here he comes now. A man with an unruly beard and shoulder-length dark hair descended the stairs. He was dressed well in new clothes, a white vest, three-button shirt, checkered trousers, and around his shirt collar he wore a stock permanently tied into a bow. Whiskey, Scott, he said as he took a seat, his attention on the mirror behind the bar rather than the reporter sitting next to him. Pardon me, Matt began. I hear you've got a strange story. The trapper took an appraising look at the young reporter. Who the hell's asking? Matthew Bartle, the Missouri Democrat. He extended a hand the trapper left unshook. Why would a fancy city reporter be interested in what a trapper has to say? The old trapper asked, 
looking at Matthew over the rim of his whiskey glass as he waited for an answer. Well, I've known Scott here a long time, and when he tells me someone has a story, it makes for titillating reading for our readers. The man stared into the mirror with a faraway look, his eyes darting as he lost himself in thought. You'd never believe me. Come on, trappers are legendary for their tall tales, Matthew pressed. Exactly. This is the tallest of them all, all true. Which is why you won't believe a word of it, he said, throwing back his whiskey. I'd better be going. He stood to leave. Dreams, Scott said, causing the trapper to stop in his tracks. I've known both of you for a long time. I can vouch for Matthew. Turned his attention to the reporter. James stays at the Everett every time he passes through St. Louis. Now, he's normally the loudest trapper with the most fantastic stories that stretch with jewelty. But, the word hung in the silence of his pause, whatever the truth to his story, it's changed him. He's humbler. You can't keep bar and not learn to spot when a man is telling the truth, pulling your leg, or outright lying. And in this, I believe him. James shook his head as he settled back onto his bar stool. Will you swear to not write it if you don't believe me? I swear it, James, Matthew replied, pulling out his pocket diary to take notes. First things first, what is your full name? James Lumley. Well, Mr. Lumley, it's a pleasure meeting you. He once more extended his hand. This time, after a brief hesitation, did James shake it. What is this extraordinary story that could so change a man? Matthew prepared to hear a fiction that aggrandized Mr. Lumley as much as its stretched credulity adopted a passive expression. Well, last September I was trapping about 75 or 100 miles above the Great Falls of the Upper Missouri. I'd set up my camp around the area known as Kadat's Pass, and just after sunset, a shooting star blazed through the sky. Now when I say shooting star, I don't know what in the hell it was. I couldn't look directly at it because it was like staring into the sun. After about five seconds, it burst, reminding me of a skyrocket. Wait, this was last September? Matthew interrupted, his voice excited and his expression no longer passive but fully engaged. Yes, James said nervously. So what? Does the name Colonel Benjamin Bonneville mean anything to you? Matthew asked as he jotted a note. Not at all, James replied. Well, he's the commanding officer of Benton Barracks here in St. Louis. Last September, he witnessed a meteor here that was also reported in Leavenworth and Galena. Leavenworth reported they saw it explode. Could it be the same luminous body? Matthew made a note of his thoughts. James shrugged. Well, I don't know about such things. I just know that after a few minutes there was an explosion that shook the earth. Then the rush of a tornado swept through the forest. A strong wind that was there one moment and then suddenly gone the next. The trapper shuddered. The stink of sulfur filled the air. That the object came from the west left me unsettled. Why? The westerly entrance to Kadat's Pass is known as Hellgate. A man in that predicament can't help but wonder if a demon had escaped hell. Eventually, I did get some sleep. In the morning, I went to check my traps I'd set about three miles east of camp. I'd gone about two miles when I came upon a new path. Several rods wide had been cut through the forest. Trees, not saplings, mind you, but massive kings of the forest were everywhere in this path uprooted. Those trees whose roots were too strong were broke off at the ground. It looked as if God himself had plowed the earth here and the trees were but grass to him. Matthew was transfixed now. Please tell me you investigated. James nodded. Against my better judgment, and I wish I hadn't given in to curiosity. What did you find? I followed the desolation and at its end was a massive stone driven into the side of a mountain. I made my way to it and as I neared it, I found bits and pieces of what I assumed was glass. The ground was dark in spots as if water or even blood had been spilled on it. You discovered Bonneville's meteor, 
Matthew was scribbling furiously in his pocket diary. Did you get near it? I did. As I got close, I saw where it had cracked open and I could peer inside. It had rooms. There were pictures on the walls, but not like what fancy city folk decorate their walls with, but more like writing. What do they call it? Like they found in Egypt? Hieroglyphics? Matthew offered. Yes, James exclaimed. While it looked like a nugget of some sort of mineral, it had to be made by man. Nothing like that exists in nature. Did you go inside? Matthew asked. James once more stared into nothingness. The silence dragged and Matthew was about to speak when James finally answered, That's my story. Matthew studied the trapper for a few moments before deciding he had enough to write a story. Thank you, Mr. Lumley. For the record, I believe you, and if you wish to read it, my article will probably run the day after tomorrow. James nodded and offered no other response as Matthew gathered his thoughts and his things and left the hotel bar. Part 2. The Gambler James was about to stand and take a walk to clear his head when a man stepped next to him at the bar. Barkeep, the stranger said. Two whiskeys. The good stuff. Scott placed two glasses in front of the man who slid one in front of James. It's common courtesy to order the man next to you a whiskey too. Scott began pouring. Thank you, James said, raising his glass. The name's Walter Dim. You can call me Walt. Hell of a story you've got. James lowered his glass and grunted. You know what I think? Walt continued. I think you fibbed to that reporter fella, saying you didn't go inside. James fixed the stranger with an icy stare. I'm no liar. I didn't say anything. Walt laughed. Well, what we don't say as often reveals more than what we do say. Is that so? James asked half-heartedly. It is. I'm something of a gambler. It's important to learn to read people so you know the cards they're holding. Walt sipped his whiskey. That's some good fire water, Scott. And what cards am I holding? I think you're out of aces and looking to cash out. Your clothes are new, so whatever you saw on that stone has made you reconsider your trade. Walt took the last swallow of whiskey, motioned to Scott to pour another. I don't want to talk about it. James responded, placing a hand over his glass. I'm not going to let drink loosen my tongue. What about a friendly game of cards? Walt said, pulling a pack out of his pocket and nodding toward the tables. An hour later, and James was looking at the pile of chips that once was his but now belonged to Walt. The other man cleared his throat and began to speak. I can tell by your face that you're all out of jacks. While money is nice, there's something I care about more than money. I love a good story, especially if it's true. Even the fantastical ones? That stretches belief, James said, letting out a sigh of resignation. Especially those, Walt said as a grin spread across his face. Well, there I was in Kadat's Pass, James began. The sun was low in the sky which told me it was about 8 o'clock that time of the year. Cadots Pass, Montana, last September. James stood in awe at the stone he witnessed break apart last night. It reminded him of a silver nugget he had seen smelted once. Right before turning to liquid, the nugget stubbornly held on to its shape, although its surface had already begun to melt. Had the smith cooled the nugget at that exact moment was the best way James would ever be able to describe the object before him. Heat, like a hot August day, wafted off the thing and he heard strange popping and pinging noises as it cooled. Had it been any hotter, he would not have been able to get any closer to a large gash in the object. A trail of the strange glass he had followed along the gash left by its crash led inside. He was thankful he still wore his summer buckskins and soft moccasins. The hairs on the back of his neck prickled as he neared it. After spending his adult life in the wilderness, he had learned to sense when he was being watched. 
Moreover, he knew the difference between being watched by man and animal. The sensation he felt was neither. When he was near enough, he could stick his head through the jagged gash he called out to anyone or anything inside. Hello? Only his echo answered. He stepped inside. His feet barely made a sound as he stepped onto a metal floor as cool as the air inside. He was amazed at the temperature drop. Bright, unnatural light blinded him as he stepped into a dark passage. When his eyes adjusted, he could see alien hieroglyphics on the walls. James explored the object going through random compartments. Some contained what looked like bunk rooms, others some sort of sanitation. The room that left him most unsettled had a large slab enough for a man to lay on. The slab did not bother him, but a group of hoses ending in various instruments reminded him of a short story he read in a hand-me-down copy of The Gift, a Christmas and New Year's present for 1843. In that story by a chap named Poe, a prisoner recalled a cruel death sentence he narrowly avoided when the French army saved him from the Spanish Inquisition. As his explorations drew him closer to the center of the object, which he had begun to think of as a grand river boat, but one that came from the heavens, he heard and felt a steady thrumming. The glass shards that had been strewn about the main passageways were thinning out as the thrumming became more intense. The temperature also began to rise. The lights flickered and he became aware of a faint green glow. Finally, he turned a corner and beheld a perfect green sphere of lightning floating in the middle of an all-white room. Along the top and bottom of the walls were the jagged remains of glass that suggested it contained the energy source. James lacked the knowledge and education to comprehend what he saw, but the suggestion that this was the craft's engine entered his mind. He began to feel nauseous and ran from the room, stopping to vomit a few times until the gash he came through came into sight. He stopped in his tracks as he saw the night sky. Best he could tell, he had only been inside the thing for an hour. But as he exited, the moon's position told him it was well past midnight. James collapsed and closed his eyes tightly. Images of where he was came into his mind. He saw the craft crashing into the mountain. A small gray creature, almost human, appearing from the gash he had entered the ship and on shaky legs stumbling into the woods lining the path of the crash. James saw himself entering. The images invading his mind sped up. Most were banal, woodland creatures living their lives in the craft's shadow as nature healed. The area left largely untouched by humans until strange men dressed in green appeared. They were in horseless vehicles, every bit as peculiar as the object he had just been in. Then the object was gone and nature returned. As did people in ever more outrageous and impractical clothes, lazily exploring the area. More horseless vehicles crunching through the path the ship made as it crashed. He fell to the ground and his mind struggled to make sense of everything he saw, including magnificent machines cruising through the blue heavens. The final thing he saw was the land completely devoid of life, a burning hot hellscape. James began to cry at the loss of the nature he loved so deeply. A soft hand on his shoulder made him look up. He screamed as he stared into the abyss of two black almond-shaped eyes. The face those eyes were set in terrified him, a dirty gray color half of which appeared to have been burned. He screamed as the creature tugged at his clothes, pulling him to his feet. He felt another set of hands on him, pulling him back towards the ship. This one had dirt smudged on its face. One of its arms hung limply at the side opposite James. No! He screamed, let go of me, please. His captors did not speak and ignored him as they just drug him towards the vessel and down the hallway to the room with the slab and strange instruments dangling from the ceiling. No, for the love of God, please. His voice grew in pitch as they laid him on the slab. He tried to move only to find he could not lift a finger. He watched as the creatures grabbed the devices and pulled them down from the ceiling towards him. Everett House Hotel, St. Louis, Missouri, 17 October, 1865. I woke up back at my camp, James said, his hand trembling as he took a sip of whiskey. It was early morning, and yet it only seemed a few hours had passed. Walt leaned back in his chair. That is an incredible tale. 
He took a sip of his own drink, and one that is truly hard to swallow. But you tell it with so much sincerity. I've read that those who study the stars believe it's probable that other planets and even meteors may be inhabited. And you, my friend, may have been the first person in history to meet one. James looked away. God save us all. I don't know about such things. I think they are demons myself. He slammed his whiskey. However, I know in my bones that I saw the future, and it terrified me more than the demon's hellish instruments. He stood. Thank you for the drink, friend, but now I'm going to take my leave. He put on his hat and tipped it before turning to leave the hotel and disappeared to history, leaving behind a newspaper article and a mystery. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Kadat's Pass, by Xavier Poe Kane. Not yet a best-selling author, Xavier Poe Kane is a former door gunner on the International Space Station. When not making the galaxy safe for democracy, he writes whatever weirdness comes to mind. He currently lives in the woods with his wife Morticia in a state of mutual weirdness with their dogs Chuck Norris and the three-legged Jabba the Hutt. Thanks to the GI Bill, he has an MFA in popular fiction writing and publishing from Emerson College. He is currently working on his second publication, a collection of short stories tentatively titled Broken Hearts and Other Horrors. You can hook up with Xavier and check out what consumes him at his website, www.xaviercane.com. That's X A V I E R. K A N E dot com. You can also go to Amazon dot com and search for Xavier O. Kane, and that will take you to his author page. Or Twitter at Xavier Kane 9 and on Facebook Xavier Kane. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens. So if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd really appreciate it. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at... Fear from the Heartland.
tales for dark nights.